John Lennon, um, when he was in fifth grade, his teacher sent a, a work assignment home with him and said, when I grow up, I want to be dot, dot, dot. And it was, you have to fill it in and you have to write some of this. And he wrote, when I grow up, I want to be happy. Mm-hmm. And the teacher handed back to him with a big red X on it and said, you didn't understand the question. <laughs> And he wrote back to he wrote back to her something really witty, which I can't remember what it was, <laughs> but something along the lines of, um, like you know, I, I think I understand it just perfectly, mm-hmm. and that's the best answer ever, right? We should be striving for happiness slash right. fulfillment, whatever that thing yeah. is, not whatever else is chasing. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm good, Patrick. Thanks. Today we are going to talk about um, something that a a few people, a few listeners reached out with different questions, different ideas. I'm kind of trying to smash them together to to Mm -hmm. get a full episode out of it. Um, And the ideas were roughly around the notion of, you know, we've talked about in the past uh, success, um, figuring out what that means, figuring out how to to live a life that uh, lines up with whatever your definition of success is. And we've talked a lot about the notion of focusing on things you can control Mm-hmm. Um, and letting go of the things that um, are maybe outside of your control. And so we got, I got a couple of questions uh, that, that were along those lines in the sense of um, folks looking for advice on how to live a life, how to, how to define success for yourself and not based on other people's defin- maybe definition of success or based on your perception of what somebody else's success looks like. And so I started thinking about what those things have in common. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a little tongue in cheek, but what, what I came away with was this notion of uh, leaderboarding in real life. Mm-hmm. You know, So leaderboarding um, is something common in CrossFit, certainly. R- really common probably in all sports to some degree. Um, but I wanted to start there with, because we've talked about it a little bit as it relates to your athletes, um, this notion of leaderboarding d- during things like the Open, but even during the games and, and uh, big events like that. So I wanted to start first with just uh, a recap or a reminder of what leaderboarding is in the, in yep. the athletic context. And um, piggybacking on that, why you work so hard with your athletes to make sure that they're not leaderboarding again, whether it's during the open or during a sanctional event or during, certainly during the games. Yeah. So, um, something I talk about with my athletes a fair amount because most athletes, when they start working with me, this is not a normal practice. Most athletes, when they finish an event, immediately just refresh, 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 and see where they are on the leaderboard. It's a little bit different at the games than it is during the open. Um, and I realize that the the games are a little bit more exclusive of a, a company that people might be able to relate to, but let me just kind of like use the games as the reference point. Yeah. When we're at the CrossFit games, there are good events and there are bad ones, kind of always, right? You're competing against the best athletes in the world and you're not always gonna finish where you wanna finish. Mm-hmm. Because of that, there is a roller coaster. It is not a smooth like, okay, I'm in first place in the first event and I just yeah. kind of hang out there. Yep. You know, minus Matt Fraser for the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but generally speaking, even for the elite of the elite, the leaderboard doesn't tell the story until the end of the event. Right. So what that means is the leaderboard does not matter, and it might even be lying to you in the middle of the event. And if you ride that emotional roller coaster along with these results that are not telling you the results of the weekend, they're telling you the story halfway through the story when it, so the, the end has yet to be written. Yeah. You could be actually selling yourself short and not living up to your potential. So let's kind of put this in real life. Um, watch the fittest film from a couple of years ago. You know, um, you see athletes at the games talking about, well, you know, I was in first place after the triple three. And then after the next event, man, I really surprised myself and I was in first place. And gosh, that feels good. If you had told me I would have been in first place, it's, man, I would have been. And then I slid back into fourth place and that really pissed me off. And like, like, 
what? And then you <laughs> realize at the end of the whole games, these athletes are in eighth place. All right. So why even be ecstatic and pumped and all this stuff when you're in second, third, fourth, fifth, when you're ending up in ninth place overall? The flip side is the exact same. Cole Sager is in last place at the, after the deadlift event at the ranch. Last place overall, not in that workout, last place overall. Yet he finishes fifth place overall in the games at the end. The story has not been written until it's over. Now, if he had leaderboarded yep. after that last place finish, maybe he starts going, whoa, maybe I don't belong here. Yeah. Whoa, I'm not as strong as these guys. Whoa, maybe I prepared completely wrong for this competition when he wasn't any of those things. He belonged. He was the fifth fittest man in the world at that point. Leaderboarding is a liar. Now, that's at the games. During the open, it can dictate things for us in the open. And we do check the leaderboard during the open because it's a different, we're looking for a different result. We right. need to keep ourselves in a certain space. And whether we redo workouts or not is dictated about where we finish in that. So mm -hmm. it's a very different dynamic in the open than it is um, in the games. The games, it's a one and done and you have to turn the page and move on. It would be the equivalent of the New England Patriots after they've won six Super Bowls, well, three of, I'm gonna get this wrong, but I believe three of those years, they started the season out with a losing record. Now imagine if they were really into the results of those week to week events. They go, whoa, maybe we don't have a good team this year. Mm -hmm. Whoa, maybe what our coach has been telling us in preseason is wrong. Whoa, like, and all the second guessing that comes along with these results, that do not matter. In the NFL, what matters is, did you get in the playoffs and what kind of momentum do you have? What kind of team are you in December? Not what are you in September. Not saying it doesn't matter and those games don't mm -hmm. matter, they do. But that doesn't tell the whole story. If you live and die week to week, like a lot of these athletes are, living and dying event to event, it's a disservice and a negative, not a plus. The other factor is, which you already talked about, is it's completely outside of our control. Mm -hmm. Like why would you put that much emphasis, either physically, emotionally, psychologically, or just pure minutes and attention to something that you have no influence over? The judge called a bad rep and because of that, it knocked you four seconds down and you lost three spots. Like, guess what? It's over, you can't control it anymore. If you keep on, woe is me looking at that, we're getting ready for the games right now, so we're yeah. looking at a lot of past footage. I can't tell you how much that goes on at the highest level, where athletes are letting stuff slip through their fingers that they have no control of whatsoever. If they instead turn their focus only onto the things that they had, that they can affect, yeah. that they can lean into and through their efforts cause things to change. That's what we want to, that's your preparation, your strategy, your ability, your um, preparation, all of those things is what we want to lean into. Not, I came in 22nd in that event. Not, I'm in first place. I, like, that doesn't matter at all anymore. Similar to that is not only do we not leaderboard and look at the leaderboard, not, not, not only do we not leaderboard and check, um, check our results after every event, if we know we won an event, it's not yeah. like, this is what certain football teams do as well. After they win an event, it's a party in the locker room. After certain athletes win an event in the CrossFit Games, it's literally like they jump into the arms of their coaches. We don't act like that because first off, we expect to do well. So when we do well, it's not a surprise. That's what we want to do. But also, whatever goes up must come down. If you celebrate wins in the middle of the season, it's not over yet. If you celebrate events in the middle of the competition, then by default, what you're going to do, I don't care who you are, you're going to get remorseful and bummed out and weigh down if you don't perform, if you have a loss, mm -hmm. or if you don't perform where you think you should. So what we do is, hey, this is what we this is what we can learn from this event. Win, lose, draw, or anything different. This is what we did well. This is what we not did, did do well. And it's systematic. And that way it is this even ride across. And that's what sets you the best up for success best. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh let's translate that to the rest of the world or the rest of life. Mm -hmm. Um sport is an incredible mirror. Yeah. Uh, it's an incredible mirror. It's an incredible metaphor, but metaphor. It, but yeah, it's, but it gets messy if you try to take too much of it and and apply it to life. But I do think that there's something interesting in this. 
um, in this idea of, of uh, or that in that attitude and figuring out how does that make sense um, everywhere else, right? Because I think, and, and the reason this idea is, uh, I think, particularly challenging for a lot of people is because we live at a time where we're kind of, we're constantly being given metrics that make us feel like yeah. we can measure ourselves against everybody else around us, right? And whether that's uh, uh, Instagram followers, YouTube subscribers, retweets, you name it, right? Yeah. Like we're inundated with these these numbers, which we then- And not even personally, but in business, like the transparency of where yeah. people are now is yep. like, you kind of know, like everyone knows what kind of revenue Amazon's doing. Everyone, right. not, it's public company, so they know that anyway. Of course. But even like all those metrics are kind of out there, yeah. right? Like speed of delivery yeah. and like everything else. In this communication age, there is so much availability of, uh, you know, it's data-driven analytics. And it happens not only in a business setting, but it, that's trickling down, as you're talking about, to right. a personal setting, right. right? Imagine being in high school right now, like, or middle school, even worse, middle school, yeah. where it's like, it is all about the popularity chase. And now mm -hmm. you have a number, right? literally, like, how many Instagram followers you have yeah. is the number of how popular you are. Right. Like, crap. That sucks. Yeah. It basically, like... If you are the kid that's like so self-conscious about that, you're basically confirming all of your worst nightmares right. of like, yeah, you're in the crowd, but like, guess what? Like everyone in the crowd has 400 more likes, 400 mm. more followers than you mm. do. Like, damn it, that's yeah. tough. Yeah, and I think that an element of that, and it's not only the, it's not only the likes and, and the metrics, but it's also the visibility. You know, th there's the cliche of, you know, Instagram is, is uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's perfect or, yeah, or image of themselves. Right. Like they're self. perfect. Ver exactly. Yeah. The perfect version of themselves. Whereas everybody knows that of course that's not the, the, unless you're my wife, Heather, it's true. who puts up all the, the exactly. Yes. But, but that's why she's refreshing. Yes. <laughs> but that's my point is not only are there the metrics and the numbers and, and, you know, I can stack my Instagram again, you know, across mm -hmm. 10 people who are, you know, 10 friends and I can in that way be measured for better or worse against them. Right. And then it's also the excess visibility of what other people's best days are versus what you yeah. know is like, today's not my best day. So, yep. you know, so I guess, I guess what I want to kind of get at today is how much of that philosophy of the, I don't want to say the avoidance, but the recognition of the, 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 the downsides of leaderboarding that we can learn in sport. How much of that can we translate to, uh, outside of sport. So I think one of the things that we've talked about before, I think on this podcast, if not, we've talked about it personally, is recognizing the game that you're playing. Mm -hmm. And we're not playing a finite game. In sport, it's a finite game. You know the rules, yep. you know who you're playing against, and you know when the event is over, and there's a scoreboard to say winners and losers. In life, we're playing a finite game. We don't know. Who, game. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yep. We're playing an infant game. We don't know who our competition is. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the scoreboard is. We don't know when the game ends. So for us to try to take the rules of sport and apply them to life in that aspect, we're really barking up the wrong tree. Because mm -hmm. what we're going to want to do is place the scoreboard and say, today... This person has more followers than I do. They're beating me. That's not the game. I don't believe yeah. that's the game any of us are playing. Yeah. I don't believe that who has the most likes, followers, subscribers, or anything else presents themselves the best on Instagram is the winner, particularly today. Mm -hmm. I believe that the person who lives a fulfilled life, not even at the end, today, tomorrow, next week, that is constantly living in the present moment to eternity, living a fulfilled life. That is the metric of success that I have deemed for myself. Mm -hmm. That is what I am chasing. I believe that's what we I believe that's what we should all be chasing. Again, we've talked about this before, but not happiness not elation, not joy, but fulfillment. Then you figure out what gives you fulfillment. Is it hard work? Is it dedication? Is it discipline? Is it passion? Is it 
um, any of the opposites of those? Is it freedom? Is it ecstasy? Is it what, what are the things that are driving you towards fulfillment? And then living into those things. So when you get on your deathbed, you look back at all of your days and say, that was it. That was what I wanted to do. I think very few people, the saying used to be very few people on their deathbed wish that they spent more time in the office. Mm -hmm. I think that that might shift a little bit and say, I think few people on their deathbed are going to wish that they had more Instagram followers. Right. That's not going to be the thing that fulfills us at all. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? We're going really, really fast. I was say into a brick wall. Yeah, like, but you're better, yours right? is <laughs> we're, it's, a, it's that analogy that we've used before, which is you're climbing the ladder, yeah. you're going, you're getting, but it's leaning up against the wrong building. Like mm -hmm. you gotta make sure you're climbing in the right direction. So it goes back to the original, what I do with all my athletes before I have this conversation about leaderboarding. I talk about the circle of control and I talk about the circle of um, concern leaderboards is a concerning thing. It's a thing that you think about, that you worry about, but you ultimately have no influence over. What would go in that in real life is also things like social media, mm -hmm. right? That for sure is the thing that you worry about, you're concerned about, but you ultimately have no control over. That's a circle of control. What we want to do is avoid the distractions. That is a distraction. So what we'll do is we'll try and focus on things that you have inside your circle of control. One of those things is your fulfillment or fill in the word success. What you need to do there then is define what success means to you. If you don't define it, you have no way of knowing if you're chasing the right thing or you're focusing on the right things. So if you figure out that and not success as you alluded to in the intro not success that what society says it's mm -hmm. not becoming you know uh, a, a billionaire it's not um having the most you know a million followers it's not it's figuring out truly and I, we could probably have a whole podcast on how to actually figure this thing out yeah. but truly what are the things that you're going to think about on your deathbed that you say like this is what i'm so glad that that's what i pursued and then what you do is figure out the factors that influence those things. And from there, you lean into those as hard as you can on the minute by minute basis of every single day and don't let seconds tick away. Mm -hmm. 86,400 or whatever it is, seconds in a day, that's not a lot. They're ticking away really fast. I don't know how many of those seconds you have left. It might be only today. It might be a 10 years. It might be, you know, now it might be 100 years right. from now, but you got to maximize your seconds every single day towards chasing your fulfillment in your definition of success because otherwise you're letting society dictate it. And society is wrong, in my opinion. Society, because what happens is there are so many people and we compare ourselves to them on social media and everywhere else of these super high achievers who are ultimately miserable in other aspects of their life. So if we're comparing ourselves to their slivers of success but not seeing the whole picture we're doing ourselves an incredible disservice we chase the athlete that's making 100 million dollars has so many followers and sneaker deals but realize he is miserable in his home life like that's not the life i want mm -hmm. but it's so easy for me to see the best version he puts himself as he puts himself on instagram and want to ch chase that it's the distraction it's the leaderboard the game's not over today what is he going to be thinking about on his deathbed? That's what you want to be measuring yourself against. Um, I, so much of this, uh, I think, really does come down to the 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 fact that we're very tribal creatures, right? We we are hierarchical. We we are maybe not consciously, but always subconsciously figuring out where we are in the hierarchy of of the the places that we are, the communities that we're in. How much? I guess that is a lead up to to this question, which is, have you always been able to define your own level of success? You know, I think back to things we've talked about before, which is, you know, like you were in, you know, you you were in finance before you before you sort of found your your passion and your in your place. Were you in finance because everything in the culture said a, a good job is one that makes mm -hmm. a lot of money and one that makes a lot of money is in finance and, and yes. whatever that. So was there a point where you woke up and you and you realized I'm, I, you know, I put my ladder up against the wrong wall or was it that you just found the right wall and you were like, I'm moving my ladder. Um, I don't know the walls and the ladders, <laughs> but, um, 
I all I was never driven. I knew my success was not tied to money. Yeah. Money has just never been a thing for me. I can remember sitting with my brother uh, one year when we were both kind of starting our our careers a little bit. He was uh, working as a um, ad sales per, per, for um, a newspaper mm. back when there were newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I and I was. Out, I hope we got out of that business he did, sooner. Yes. Okay. Now he's in pharmaceutical sales. <laughs> so now he's a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah, I was a drug dealer. <laughs> um, and I was starting my career in finance. Yeah. And I can remember sitting there, and we were. I remember because we were at a. We were sitting at a bar and uh, where we both went to college and him telling me that um, he wanted to earn more money than our father made. Mm -hmm. And that was the most abstract thought to me. Like I, it didn't even make, I never even thought about that. First I was like, wow, that's really, that's cool. Like, but also I was like, ah, like that's, that's not what I'm, that's so far from what I'm driven by. Yeah. And the fact that I went into finance right away should have been like a big eye opener. Like, dude, you're, this isn't you. This doesn't mm. mesh. Yeah. This isn't. Um, and then as we talked about before is I, I had the epiphany, the realization, the blindfold pulled off of my eyes when 9-11 hit, right. happened. And it was the impetus for me to have that career change and realize like the life is too short and I want to have greater purpose and meaning. Mm. And I want to do other things than sit behind a computer. I didn't know what that was at the time. Right. Um, but that's what forced me out of that chase, it literally was like, um, when that happened, it was, you need to change. It was mm -hmm. a really impactful moment in my life, as it was for so many people. Um, it's shaped who I am um, and forced me every single time. It's a guiding, it's a guidepost for me to know that if I listen to my gut, I, will, I think I'm going to be happy with the end results. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think... And I don't want to. I don't want to use your brother an example as an example, but but as that story, the why do you think some folks end up focusing so much on those kind of externalities, right? The I'm going to make X amount a year because then I'll be successful, or you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank of whatever it is. What what do you think it is that makes th though? I don't know if it's that makes that attractive or makes it so easy to fall into the trap of letting other people dictate the how you're how you're going to define success for yourself whether again it's it's money or if we want to call f Instagram fame fame whatever that is yep. any any sense of like what is it that that leads to or allows somebody to fall into that trap um without getting too deep into this i think it's the education system mm. i think that we've been taught through school that if you work hard get good grades you get a good job you get to go to a good college mm -hmm. you get it you work hard at college you get recruited at a good job if you get a good job you earn a lot of money if you earn a lot of money you have a this is the the big gap you have a happy life mm -hmm. and that's the disconnect that's what i don't believe is true i believe that in after achieving a certain amount of wealth which is enough to like take care of the basic necessities of life which is you know food shelter you know things like that yep. you're you know well, you don't have to worry financially about paying the bills basically there's very little correlate to like um how much money you have i my take on this mm -hmm. versus um how happy you are yep. now i do believe there is a nice piece thing called fin like financial security where yep. you could if your kid got sick you could take six months off of work and then be okay. That to me is like, if you can do that, like do like, that's the ultimate. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing else after that, that money's gonna get you. That's the financial security you need to make sure you got it, in my mind. Yep. So if you have six months of living expenses in the bank, like you're good. Like mm -hmm. that's just like, you're good. But I believe that the disconnect is because we've been told by society, education, the, the whole schooling system, that that is what we are all chasing. And no one's taken the time to talk to kids and actually say like, what do, would make you happy? Not saying this is what you should be chasing, which mm -hmm. is what we're doing. Get good grades, good college, good job, lots of money, happy. That's the finish line, kids. That's the finish line. Earn a million dollars and you are happy. And I just don't think that's the case. I, I can't remember who it is, but it's a, a super high achiever. And maybe you'll know this. Um, oh, no, I know who it is. It's John Lennon. Mm -hmm. John Lennon, um, when he was in fifth grade, 
his teacher sent a, a work assignment home with him and said, when I grow up, I want to be dot, dot, dot. And it was, you have to fill it in and you have to write some this. And he wrote, when I grow up, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. And the teacher handed back to him with a big red X on it and said, you didn't understand the question. <laughs> And he wrote back to he wrote back to her something really witty, which I can't remember <laughs> what it was, but something along the lines of, um, like you know, I, I think I understand it just perfectly, mm -hmm. and that's the best answer ever, right? We should be striving for happiness slash right. fulfillment, whatever that thing yeah. is, not what everyone else is chasing. Yeah. I don't say what everyone else is chasing. I think a lot of people listening to this probably are not. Mm -hmm. It's 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 interesting because uh, you mentioned early earlier the the. And I totally agree with you. The, the middle schooler who now gets a, a daily reminder of their their How tough popularity. Is that? But if you were to, but you if you were to ask them, the thing that they would want is Instagram fame or YouTube fame or you know whatever it is. You know, so it's 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 early that this notion of. Uh, and maybe the word is popularity, but it's probably more. Well, important. as you say, because we're hierarchical, right? Yeah. You're trying to climb the social right. ladder of yep. where I am and establish dominance. If you can't establish dominance, you at least want to establish and hold your place. Mm -hmm. That's really important to us as a tribal society to figure out where we are in, yeah. in that ecosystem. Yep. So it's one of the things that that's not going to go away. Right. That's part of our DNA right. and but our makeup. The, but these tools have... have Set them the, on fire. I, yeah, but and I think that the tools are lying. Mm. I just don't think that that's the real thing. So, like, if you're one of those, like, you know, those kids that just so, like, you know, you're a 13 year old or 14 year old kid who is so at peace with themselves, and maybe like, you know, I don't think these are common kids. <laughs> no, I was gonna, right? Yeah, I was trying to think of one. But. Yes, it, but so like Zen, yep. so living in the moment, so fulfilled, so earthly so down you know um, wise beyond their years and they don't have an instagram account or they only have six followers like um that kid that kid that's that wouldn't i don't think would be using that as the measuring stick mm -hmm. because they would understand right, right but it's such a rarity right because everyone else is saying that that's the measuring so that's the leaderboard yeah that's what we use in the middle of the event to gauge how we're doing but as we said it's not it's never in the middle of the event that we want to be checking that because you're going to say i'm on the wrong path i'm on the i'm not prepared i'm this is i'm not as good as these people when cole sager you don't check it mm -hmm. you wait till the end of the event wait till the end of your life as long as you stay on the path that you set forward that you've deemed the right path that's the way to get to mastery of yourself mm -hmm. now as you said really hard for a 13 or 14 year old to do that because we've been ingrained with that thing yeah. how to switch them out of that it's a million dollar question yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. right i mean yeah. um as i said i think that there's probably like the 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 one in a thousand you know there's maybe one kid in every three middle schools mm -hmm. that's like that um but it's the diamond in the rough and i think that everyone else has been uh, brainwashed by the leaderboard, mm -hmm. much like they the competitors in our sport. Mm -hmm. They're brainwashed by the leaderboard. Um, I want to flip it the the conversation a little bit because as I was thinking through this this idea, I did start to think about or see some places where this this and I, and I hesitate to say this kind of comparison, but but this kind of comparison can be helpful. Right. And I'll use my I'll use myself as an example. I'll use us as an example because it's I think it's appropriate. And so when I in 2015 ish, when I left again faster and trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do next. And the the one thing that was the, the one good idea that I had was because you and I had known each, have known each other for years and years because early CrossFit, everybody knew each other. <laughs> um, and so the one good idea I had was I said, I don't know why when Ben does things, they end up seeming to work. And obviously I was I was on the outside. So I was just sort of viewing CrossFit New England and like it was early comp train then, but you had some teams at the mm -hmm. games. So from my my distant vantage point, I was like, whatever Ben's doing seems to be like, it seems to be working. And I'd love to know more. I'd love to be able to see, or I'd love to be able to help him so that I could learn how to do that, 
right? And so, uh, and and so that's kind of how you know long long story you know short story long. Um, that's how we ended up here because mm-hmm. uh, we figured out some places for us to work together, and we've continued to do so. And so I bring that up only to say, in many ways, I was comparing myself to you at that point, but I wasn't doing it in the sense of in a way that denigrated myself, right? When I, when I said, damn it, Ben's so much more successful than I am. But I, I, but I did it in a way of saying, I wonder what a secret is. Mm. I wonder if I could, I could figure something out if I got close enough to him, right? And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on the positive end of leaderboarding, if, if that exists, or, yeah. or am I describing something else? <laughs> is it not that? Um, so first off, flattered that that's why we are where we are today. Um, so that's really cool to hear. Um, and as you know, now, not everything I touch turns to gold. Right. right. But that's, yeah. yeah, of course. Um, so here's my take on this. You don't want to compare your first chapter to someone's end of the book. For sure. Right. So, you know, and there's, a, a, there's a, a, a plenty of memes about this out there of like, you know, pictures of Jeff Bezos, you know, in his um, ratty little closet of an office with this, you know, looks like a a paper made banner that says Amazon on it. And he's the sole employee. And now, you know, fast forward 20 years later, and he's the richest man that's ever been alive. You know, it's, you don't want to compare because if you look at, if you're just comparing to where he is today, you're like, oh, I can never do that. Right. Like nobody can. (laughs) Nobody can. Yeah. Yeah. No one can walk in and do that today. Yeah. But there is room for, I like what you're saying, comparing the leaderboard and the results to try and find out um, wins and losses, I believe is detrimental. Mm -hmm. But that's very, very different than taking a high achiever that you admire in a certain area and trying to extract best practices for why they've achieved what they've achieved. Mm -hmm. So if I was to look at the totality of someone like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk and be like, I want to be like them. Well, I don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is I want to be able to run a business like them. So what I want to do is lean into their business aspect and figure out what are some of the best practices that they've done. And I've done just that. Mm -hmm. I've shared with my whole team a letter that Jeff Bezos has written to his stakeholders at Amazon. Every single year I read that to to them because I think it's so powerful. I similarly read a, um, a letter that Jack Welch wrote to a, in a commencement speech because he's an amazing leader of GE back in the, the 80s. I do so much from Steve Jobs. I don't want to be like any of those people, but I want to learn from the best practice that they've accomplished. Mm-hmm. In the athletic arena, it's the same thing. I don't want any of my athletes to try and figure out, are they better than another athlete? But what we'll do is we'll figure out where are the other athletes, what are their numbers, and then if we can extract how they got there, that's really powerful. So what we do is in our sport, you have to have certain numbers to be competitive. So for um, a girl, you should have a 300-pound back squat to be competitive at the CrossFit Games level. That's one of the things. If you don't have that, okay, this is an area for you to improve. It's showing you the gaps and the strengths and the weaknesses. Just like a business, we would do a SWOT, S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We do a SWOT analysis for all of our athletes. And you have to, the only way you can do that, if you lived in a vacuum, if you were the only human being on earth and no, or let's say made more extreme, you're born on Mars and you never see another human being. How in the world would you do a SWOT analysis? Mm-hmm. You have no reference for what a strength or a weakness or opportunity or threat would be. Right. So you need, the only way you're able to do those things is through comparison. In that aspect, comparison is incredibly beneficial. It's the same type of thing where if we're going to dig into the business and I find across the business, like, you know, we have a SaaS business, a subscription, online subscription, software subscription business. The industry average is about an 11% churn rate, meaning you lose about 11% per month in that. If we find out that we are at 41%, mm. we have no area of comparison. We're like, I don't know, we're holding on to 60%. That's <laughs> right. more than half. That right. sounds pretty, like there's no, we have no, but you've got to figure out, no, there's industry standards. There's industry averages. Okay, let's see if we can get to that. Can we get below that? Can we get, 
can we get you know half of that? Can we get mm -hmm. down to 5% churn? Like then all of a sudden it becomes, it dictates your practices that you set up to achieve that means. It's incredibly beneficial to use comparisons when they're set up to benefit. If they're set up for detrimental things, so if we're gonna compare ourselves to not the back squat of our competitors, but the back squat of the strongest females in the world, and we see it there in the 600 pounds, and we're at 30%, we're like, oh, mm. we're not even close. Like, yeah. we're, why are we even doing this? You have to figure out who are the cohorts, who are the people that you deem as the people that you are chasing, what are their metrics that they are getting, figure out the strengths and weaknesses you have inside of you, and then from there, you pull out the best practices of how they've gone about achieving it, and that's how you set yourself up to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. In the personal realm, it's hard to do that mm. because in the personal realm, it's about six, in the games, it's really easy because we're playing the finite game. They give a medal to one person. It's the person with the most points at the end of the week. Really, really simple. But in life where there isn't that scoreboard, to us to artificially put a scoreboard on that, you're, that's, you're gonna only hurt yourself. So that's where you comparing yourself on a personal level is not gonna help you. You should not be leaderboarding in a personal aspect. This is where the parallel, as you said, the metaphor of um, sport and business are so tied together. Mm. The metaphor of of sport to life is a major different gap. And you know, some people would argue that we shouldn't be playing the finite game in business mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. You're only playing the finite game to me if you have investors, stakeholders. You have to have quarterly returns. You have to have the short term yep. thing because you have to answer to people. Yep. Someone gave you fifty thousand dollars. They want. $52,000 back, <laughs> right. right? If well, you're lucky, yes, you're probably yeah, probably more than a that. lot more than that, <laughs> right? But if you are, if you are doing, if you're opening up a painting company, yep. like you can play the finite game. Like you don't have to, let's say you're a college kid starting a painting business. Don't take on investors. One of the reasons I've, I've never taken on an investor in anything I've done yeah. is because I don't believe, I think everyone else is by default kind of playing that finite game. Give credit where it's credit due. This is Simon Sinek type yep, stuff. Totally. Um, Everyone else seems to be playing the finite game and I, that's not the rules I oblige by. Mm -hmm. I want to just kind of do the things that at the end of my deathbed, I'm saying like, I'm so glad I did that. Right. And if I have to try to um, live that inside quarterly returns, like I know I'm setting myself up for a failure. Yeah. Um, I think that might be a good place to end it. Cool. Cool. All right, Pat. Thanks. All right, man. Bye. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.